Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to get started in another minute or two. So if you need a chance to go grab a drink of water, go grab a snack, feel free to do that. And we'll get started in about 90 seconds or so. All right, it looks like we have a good little group here. So uh, let's go ahead and get things started. All right, well, I would love to uh, kick off with introductions. Um, so hi, everyone, super excited for everyone that was able to join us today. My name is Bridget Moran. I'm our content manager here at Course Dog. So focused on all things uh, research content related. Uh, I've particularly spent a lot of time investigating um, what the research tells us about scheduling, best practices. So really excited to share with us with all of you today. And I'll go ahead and kick it over to Brian now to introduce himself. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, folks. I'm Brian Smith. I'm the product manager for events and scheduling at Course Talk. So looking forward to uh, talking to you all about some scheduling best practices today and uh, answering any questions that you all have. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. Well, before we dive into things, I want to give a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So first off, we'll start by looking at what the research really tells us about the connection between scheduling and student success. Next, we'll go ahead and talk about, you know, what are some of those common challenges that many institutions face and how students are often impacted by those scheduling challenges. And and specifically, we'll talk about what this means for different student groups on your campus and how some of our underserved students are often most impacted by scheduling that doesn't meet their needs. And, and then finally, we'll go ahead and talk about what practices we should all be thinking about when it comes to making sure that our schedules are student centric. And so we'll go through what it means to solicit student feedback, use data to inform your schedule, and of course, what role technology plays in all of this. And we'll leave question, we'll leave time at the end for questions. But if you do have any questions that come up during the presentation portion, definitely feel free to either drop those in the chat or the Q&A. And Brian and I will do our best to get to them um, either in the moment or at the end of the presentation. And I'll also note that we're going to be doing a few polls throughout today's session. So Really looking forward to getting everyone's perspectives on the topics that we'll be talking about today. And then one final housekeeping item. I know we often get this question a lot. Um, yes, we will be sending out um, a copy of the recording of this webinar and of the deck. So you all will have that for your reference and you'll be able to, to reference that later if you need to. All right, well, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into things. So Brian and I spend a lot of our time talking to folks really across higher ed about their scheduling practices and the pain points that they experience. And I, I highlighted just a few of the common themes that we hear here on this slide. And you know, the, these are really comments we're hearing from institutions of all shapes and sizes. And one of the themes that really comes across many of these comments we've gathered is that you know, current scheduling practices really, you know, aren't working for students. And whether this is not having enough courses or sections available for students, or, or you know, maybe students are finding that courses they need are, are being offered at overlapping times, or, you know, maybe they don't even know how to find which courses they need to take. And, and of course, what you see here on the side is, is really just a small sampling of what we hear. And and we know that, you know, these problems certainly, you know, aren't unique to all of us on the line. I, I think, you know, many of us are are really feeling this. And 
I think it's also probably no secret to anyone here that a significant number of students aren't enrolled in enough credits to finish their degree on time. So I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the 15 to finish campaign and this launched over 10 years ago with the aim of encouraging students to enroll in 15 credits in their first semester. So that way, making sure that they're, you know, staying on track for on time completion. And while it might seem obvious to many of us that, you know, students really should be taking those 15 credits a term to finish their program on time, many students actually, you know, aren't aware of this. And 15 to finish campaigns across the country have shown strong results, but we know that there's still work to be done here. The data you see on this side demonstrates just how far we have to go. So across the board, it, it, it really shows here that students aren't taking enough credits to finish their degrees on time. While there are definitely some variations across institutional segments, I, I think we can all agree that we have our work cut out here. So on the left, you'll see the average number of credit hours taken by all students in their first year. And it, it definitely paints a somewhat alarming picture. However, on the right, you'll see it's, it's even a bit more concerning if you look at the number of credit hours taken by Pell Grant students in their first year. If you look at the comparisons at four-year institutions, ex excluding those research universities, 31% of all students take 30 credits in their first year while just 26% of Pell Grant students at those same institutions take 30 credits in their first year. And it's interesting, the disparity is actually even greater if you look at those four-year institutions with the highest research designation. So at those institutions, 45% of all students take 30 credits in their first year compared to just 36% of their Pell Grant peers. And, and you know, I think this is concerning for a number of reasons, but I think first and foremost, we have to look at you know, the impact that this has on students. And the data on this slide is from studies done within the University System of Georgia. And it shows that the percentage of students at state universities in Georgia that graduated within six years, and this is based on the number of credits taken in their first semester. And at least to me, when, when I first saw these numbers, I, I found them to be a bit startling. While 54% of students who took 15 or more credits in their first semester graduated within six years. Only 43% of their peers who took 12 to 14 credits graduated in that same time period. And it just keeps going down from there. So just 22% of students who took seven to 11 hours in their first semester graduated within the first year. And we know that this trend, you know, isn't really unique to just Georgia. So research done in Tennessee at community colleges there have shown that students who take 15 or more credits in their first semester were 6.4% more likely to graduate, controlling for other factors. And, and the same study of four-year students within Tennessee found that those that took 15 credits or more in their first semester were 11% more likely to graduate. So I think this really begs the question, if we know that the number of credits students take in their first year has such a large impact on their ability to graduate, then, you know, why aren't more students taking a full load in their first term and first year? I think it's important to note that, you know, like pretty much all of the problems that we're tackling across higher ed, we know that there isn't just one cause for this problem. So, for example, many students might not even know what counts as a full load. While students need to take that, you know, 15 credits a semester to graduate on time, Federal financial aid only requires students to take 12 credits a semester to maintain that full-time status. And so for some students, you know, this might mislead them into thinking that, you know, oh, I, I only need to take 12 credits a semester and then, then I'm good to go. And of course, we also know that external factors influence students' decisions to take a full load or not. You know, family, friends, or perhaps maybe even in some cases, advisors might counsel students to, you know, quote unquote, ease into their college career. However, what they don't know is that studies have shown that students who take 15 credits in their first, first semester don't really fare any worse than their counterparts who take fewer credits. And, and some studies have even shown that students are more likely to earn better grades if they take that full load in their first year. And of course, we know that, you know, our students are juggling outside commitments. You know, they, they have a lot more going on than, than just their studies. They're 
caregivers, their employees, they have many, many outside commitments. And but where we'll be focusing our time today is course accessibility. So if students can't access the courses they need, then they won't be able to take enough credits to stay on track for that on-time completion. I think the quote that you see on the right side of this slide really sums it up well. So Dr. Tristan Dunley said that, you know, oftentimes students aren't able to take the classes they need because of the way we create the schedule. And Dr. Dunley certainly isn't the only one who's told us this. And I love the quote here on this slide by one of our partners, Dr. Casey Bullock at Weber State University. And he noted that it's easy to say that, you know, students aren't following the plan or students aren't following the process, but we really have to investigate, you know, what we're doing and ask if we're making it more difficult for students to get through. And how often are we creating those roadblocks? And so these are exactly the type of questions that, you know, we have been thinking about, you know, Today's students look different from, you know, five, 10 years ago. They're often, you know, older, more experienced with technology, uh, have different expectations and, and have different obligations outside of higher ed. And so how can we make it easier for them to access the courses they need, you know, at the times that work for their schedules and, you know, really build around their other commitments? So, You know, I, I think these quotes are great, but of course, a lot of us will say, well, yeah, that's that's anecdotal, um, you know, it might not reflect the student's experience, but I, I think the data really backs this up. Uh, so a few years ago, ACRO conducted a, a pretty comprehensive survey on course scheduling, and the survey reached, you know, over 340 institutions, and of those institutions, only 27% of them agree that they engage in student-centric scheduling. So this means that three out of four of those institutions either disagree or, you know, can't fully say that they conduct student-centric scheduling. And so this is pretty interesting, but, you know, I found myself asking, what do students have to say about this? And so last year we partnered with College Pulse and we conducted a survey of, of 1500 students about their experience with scheduling and other academic processes on campus. And, and this data confirmed that, you know, many institutions do still have room for improvement here. Overall, the majority of students surveyed said that they've experienced challenges when trying to enroll in classes that they need. So six in 10 actually said that they frequently or somewhat frequently experience issues trying to enroll in the classes they need, either to meet those major or general education requirements. And however, only 11% of students said that they've never experienced issues trying to enroll the classes they need. And you'll see that, of course, you know, the results do vary slightly between students at two and four year institutions. However, overall students were most likely to say that they encountered issues when a class was already full or a class wasn't offered at a time that worked for their schedule. So I think this really suggests that, you know, the schedule isn't always built with student needs at the forefront. And I, I think that this can mean several things. You know, this might mean that classes are full, there are too many overfilled sections, you know, there aren't enough seats to meet student demand. And of course, this can happen for several different reasons. Um, it might be a lack of instructional resources or or maybe you all just don't have the right data to assess that student demand. And so I think there is there's definitely a, a lot to unpack here. So in the next section, we'll we'll look at some more of those challenges and then how we can begin to address them. And... Yep, awesome. I'll take it from here, Bridget. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about uh, how scheduling practices create barriers for students, and we're going to look specifically at how some of the most underserved students aren't being served uh, by existing scheduling practices. Here's a couple of just examples there, and uh, I think a lot of the errors laid out on this slide will, will resonate uh, with many of the folks on the call today, and I'll just speak from experience and uh, in a previous life, I worked at an online community college uh, where we had students who uh, faced a lot of the same challenges that Bridget was just talking about between work, caregiving, families, whatever the case might be. Um, and so all the challenges of making sure that there's 
multiple sections that they can actually take times that work for them. So uh, definitely think this is a, a really important uh, issue for all of us to be thinking about. Um, and, you know, right now class conflicts come up in pretty much all of the conversations we have with academic administrators about scheduling issues. Uh, we know how much time staff's been trying to coordinate schedules and plan schedules and make sure everything uh, works and make sure all the information is entered correctly into the SIS. Uh, it can be really tough to audit all the co-recs, all the pre-recs for all the different academic uh, departments and make sure that things are scheduled at different times that work for students. Uh, and some things are just going to slip through the, uh, through the cracks and there's going to be conflicts where students can't take uh, the courses uh, that they need. Um, or, you know, once the schedule goes live, uh, then students notify someone and, and have to try to switch courses or, or request uh, a different time or whatever the case might be. Um, and students may be already planning to take or, or registered for competing courses uh, and have to hustle at the last minute to find a new section or course that will keep them on track. Uh, and that can be super stressful and challenging. Uh, we probably all went through something similar as students. So can understand that side of things. Um, and the next two errors may be a little bit less common, but they can also have a huge impact on the students uh, that are facing these. So for dual grading, students may sign up for a class that they're not as strong in, thinking they can take it pass fail. In reality, it's a it's a uh, letter grade course, um, and there's just a mistake in the catalog or in the schedule, uh, the registration system, um, but it's too late. A student's registered for the course uh, and now has to take a course kind of on a, on a different grading scale than they were expecting, and it may not be the right choice for them. Uh, or when it comes to variable unit courses, um, errors there can add a burden on students to quickly determine uh, if they're going to be able to take enough courses to stay on track and maintain their financial aid. Uh, and of course, that can be a, a huge problem if that doesn't work out for a student. And we also know from talking to our partners that inefficiencies in the scheduling process lengthen time to completion. Uh, but what does this actually look like? So we partnered with University Business to conduct a survey on academic operations and how uh, inefficiencies can, can actually impact students. Um, we had over 220 responses and 65% of the res respondents said that course scheduling issues either significantly or somewhat impact uh, students' time to completion. Uh, so that's a, a very high percentage of folks responding in that way. Um, and definitely something to think about when we're thinking about scheduling best practices. And another thing that, that we've seen a lot of is scheduling that favors uh, faculty needs over student needs. Um, and so we know that just basic scheduling errors can impact students, but there are a lot of other factors uh, at play when creating a course schedule. Um, and in that same ACRO survey that Bridget mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, we actually also asked institutions about the top factors they considered when building their course schedule. And you'll see that uh, some of the top factors are uh, the schedule from the previous term, faculty availability, and faculty preference. So those are all very important things. We want to keep faculty available, ready to teach, and, and happy. Um, and it can also be great to reuse a previous term schedule uh, if it was a very solid schedule that worked for students. Uh, but you'll notice that not in this list are uh, student needs or student focused metrics such as new enrollment, students who are waitlisted for a previous course, uh, and things like what are prime time scheduling uh, hours? Are students available to attend this class when it's offered or are things being packed into just a couple of hours on campus when it's going to be really tough for students to enroll in the classes they need. Uh, so we spend a lot of time thinking about what happened when faculty preferences are put first um, versus when student needs are, are put first. So with all that being said, we want to hear from you all and kick off this first poll. Um, we'd love to learn from you about what you're hearing from students at your institution. and. As you can see here on your screen, the first poll question is, which complaints do you hear from, do you frequently hear from students about course access? And feel free to choose a couple of options here. Um, and we'll leave this poll open for a few seconds or, or a minute, and then we'll check back in on responses.
All right. So I think everyone can see the results now. And we have uh, a pretty even split across all of these, uh, I guess, by a small percentage, uh, seven points, uh, where the winner is. The class is offered at the same time as another class I need to take, um, very similar to the class not working with my schedule or or being full um, and, and not being offered in the term. And of course, I think we can think of all sorts of scenarios where these are crucial, both with first year students, as we were talking about earlier, with students trying to graduate uh, and with students who are just trying to stay on track uh, and work around their work schedules, their academic schedules, whatever may be happening in their lives. So uh, yeah, these are all very, very important issues. And uh, if there were any other items that come to mind, I know no one selected that here, but feel free to uh, throw it in the chat or add any context if you think uh, it would be useful to talk about specific issues you all have gotten familiar with. All right. So now we're going to look at course offerings being misaligned with student demand. Uh, so there's some student complaints highlighted on the slide talking about what happens when schedules aren't aligned with student needs and don't look at the actual data around student demand. Uh, if students, uh, when schedules are created from scratch each year, uh, sometimes we can just be guessing uh, or basing these preferences on some of those faculty needs or academic department needs, needs that we talked about earlier, uh, or if schedules are just rolled over from year to year uh, and not really tracking how demand is changing uh, or how student needs are changing, uh, we can run into one of these problems. Um, and we talked to, to registrars and other uh, admins uh, at some of the, the schools we work with. And you know we'll hear that even if student preferences aren't changing, um, just rolling a, a schedule over each term isn't going to meet student needs. Um, it may not have been perfect in the first place and you could just be rolling over uh, a schedule that already had problems if you're not uh, looking each year or each term uh, and trying to really improve uh, the schedule that you've already got. Um, maybe the same courses don't offer enough sections each year and students aren't able to enroll them or classes aren't offered at times that work with student schedules um, or students with busier lives, jobs, caretaking responsibilities uh, may just have uh, a different set of times when they're available and courses aren't uh, really uh, tailored to meet those needs. Uh, so yeah, this is just a a sample of, of those issues that we're familiar with, but uh, I'm sure you, you all have heard uh, similar things, but also, again, curious to hear if anything else has come up and if you want to share it in the chat, very curious to take a look there. Uh, and here, thinking about how these issues can impact students. Uh, so we know that the impact of, of some of these challenges isn't equal across all students at an institution. Um, we could talk a, a lot uh, about a, a lot of different examples here, uh, but just want to point out a few key ones. Uh, we know many administrators are worried about employed students being able to access the courses they need, uh, balancing that with their working life. Will the students be able to take all the courses they need before work, after work? Uh, can they afford to be, you know, traveling back and forth between campus, or how are they going to work out their time between, you know, needing to be at a full-time job potentially in getting to and from campus and finding the, sorry, finding the, the course times that they need. Uh, and then there's other students besides working students who are impacted disproportionately. Uh, for example, if two required courses are accidentally scheduled at the same time, students are gonna have to choose between those courses, may not take a full load, uh, and this may impact students who uh, need that full load to qualify financial, uh, for financial aid or uh, if a course with variable units is marked incorrectly, students may find out after registration that they're not gonna receive the number of credits they expected. Uh, this can have similar ramifications for uh, financial aid uh, and can disproportionately impact uh, certain groups of students as well. Um, yeah, and we, we've talked with administrators that are concerned about uh, course access for transfer students who may have a different set of needs students that are uh, commuting to and home uh, to and from campus on the weekends, gap year students, student athletes, all these different groups that we have to think about uh, when building a schedule. So we know there are a lot of different groups at play here. 
Now we're going to take a look at our second poll. Um, and here we want to hear from you about which groups of students on your campus are you most worried about accessing the courses they need. So this one is just single choice. We're going to force you all to, to make a choice here, and then we'll talk through uh, what seem to be the most, uh, the groups you're all most concerned about right now. Yep. So, you know, it looks like that. we, oh yeah, yeah. go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yeah, first gen students, um, definitely a, a unique set of factors to think about there from academic support, coaching, in addition to all of the, the scheduling concerns. Um, and yeah, again, a pretty even set of results here. These are all, um, scheduling factors that, that we really have to take into consideration. Um, yeah, students relying on public transit is, is another interesting one to think about from just the timing perspective. Um, and then of course, some of the groups we, we talked about already are, are called out here. Um, yeah, we'd love to see in the chat any other um, thoughts on, on this poll or what we've just covered so far. Uh, but Bridget, I'll kick it back to you for the next slide. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Brian. And and like he said, if you have any further comments, feel free to drop those in the chat. But on this slide, we're going to talk through um, just a couple of the different groups that we had on the previous slide, but go in, into a little bit more depth here. And I think most of these um, align pretty well with the, uh, I think, top groups that you all responded with um, in the poll there. So first, students with children. I, I think, you know, it's it's no surprise that these students have time constraints due to their caretaking, responsi uh, caretaking responsibilities. And oftentimes, you know, they really have to be very intentional about when they're completing their courses. You know, maybe they need to be taking their courses at night or maybe uh, while their children are at school during the day. So institutions with large populations of students with children should consider questions such as, you know, how far away are those local K through 12 schools from your campus? Um, what times are those schools in session? And do those schools or other local organizations offer childcare that's available um, either before or after school? So for example, I was recently talking with a community college administrator and she was telling me that many of their students have children that go to the local school. So in order to accommodate this large population, they're thinking about introducing scheduling bans that would allow these students to take all of their classes during a certain time period while their children are in school. So, you know, they, they just have to be on campus for that one chunk of time. And then once they're done, you know, they're, they're out of there and they can go ahead and pick up their kids from school. Employed students are another population that, of course, have many time constraints around when they can take, can take classes. So I think there are, there are a couple of different questions that you can ask here, such as, you know, what types of industries are your students most commonly working in? And who are those major employers in the industry, um, you know, in your local community? And, and what are their typical hours of operation? So, for example, if students are commonly working in retail and, and hospitality industries, um, you know, these these are typically stores that need more workers in the afternoon and evenings. Uh, next, we have here students who rely on public transportation. I know Brian called that one out as an interesting one. And um, yeah, definitely pretty interesting for me to think through as well. Um, you know, if you don't have a car and you're relying on the bus, um, does that bus, you know, arrive in time for the first course of the day or is there a bus available at the end of the day after the last class ends? And you know, maybe maybe if it doesn't come very frequently, will students have a safe place to wait until they're able to access it? And then finally, of course, on the slide, we have low income students. So I think, you know, be intentional not just about course access, but also thinking about timing that relates to other services that these students might rely on. So, you know, 
Are students able to af uh, access tutoring services or technology labs before or after their scheduled classes? And I know there's definitely a lot we could go into here on this slide. Um, we could probably talk about this for hours. So let's go ahead and move on um, into our final section for today, where we're going to talk about um, how we can address some of these challenges. So thinking about, you know, how do we solicit student feedback? How are you using data to inform your schedule? And what role technology alls, all of this plays? And so one of my first big projects when I actually first joined Course Dog was to spend a few months interviewing academic administrators, um, thinking about their scheduling practices. And one of the questions I always like to ask was, you know, do you have a method of collecting student feedback whenever a student comes to you with a scheduling challenge? And, you know, most of the time the response I got was like, no, or, or you know, we just get anecdotal feedback, but we don't really have a central place for storing these student scheduling requests, and, which is very understandable, right? There's, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to creating a schedule. However, I, I did speak with one institution and I loved the fairly simple solution that they came up with for collecting student feedback. And, and I really love this because I think it's something that can, you know, hopefully be implemented fairly easily. So this institution created an online shareable spreadsheet that deans, course schedulers, advisors, and student success coaches could access. And, and whenever a student came to one of these individuals with a class issue or request, they noted it in the spreadsheet and, you know, everyone was able to see that. Deans could view that spreadsheet and then if they did see that there was a critical mass of requests for one sort of course, they could, you know, review that documentation and then think about, you know, adding additional sections to meet that student demand, you know, as, as capacity and resources allow. So if the Dean does go ahead and decide to open up a new section, they would then go ahead and email advisors to let them know about that class opening so they could then pass it along to students. So, and I think this is really great because like I said, it's a seemingly simple process, but it can definitely have a big impact. And so the institution I was speaking with uh, who implemented this, they told me that they were able to open up 17 new sections as a result of this tracking. And this isn't just, you know, obviously a huge win for students who otherwise, you know, wouldn't have been able to take these classes, but also an additional source of tuition revenue for the institution. This is just one way to track student preferences, but I think there are also a, a couple of more proactive ways to think about this as well. I will note that, you know, institutions, it does feel like are, are frequently serving students on a variety of topics. But at least when I'm talking to folks, it seems like course scheduling and course access is rarely one of those topics. And however, these questions can sometimes give really helpful insights into how administrators think about creating the course schedule. So you'll see the areas listed on the left here, modality, time of day, day of week. Um, you know, these student preferences are, are definitely important to think about logistically, but I think the topics on the right side here are just as important. So institutions should seek to understand how different groups of students are impacted by course access and ask demographic questions such as about their enrollment status, um, if you have multiple campuses, which campus they attend, and the goal of their studies. And so surveys are a great way to gather this feedback, um, both at you know, the institutional and personal level. So you know, what are your preferences for time of day? But then personally, you know, why might you not be able to access the courses you need? Like we've been saying, you know, students are dealing with many, many other things in their life. And, you know, is that perhaps impacting their ability to access the courses they need? I do always like to caveat when I'm talking about this slide that we, of course, need to be wary of over-surveying our students. I think particularly in the past, you know, few years, students have been getting asked to complete many, many surveys. So you know, perhaps you're not able to run a, an individual survey just about scheduling, but I always think it's great to think about, you know, other areas where you could perhaps just incorporate a couple of questions here so you can start to get an idea of what your students are thinking about. 
So with that being said, I will hand it back over to Brian now to talk a little bit more about uh, the data aspect of informing your schedule. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. And as you all see here, I think a really interesting question that uh, we think about in a lot of different contexts is, is somewhat using data good enough anymore? Uh, kind of an interesting question from, from the product side for us, but of course, thinking here about how institutions are using uh, data in their scheduling process. Um, and so in this survey that, that we've been referencing with university business, we asked about the role of data in course scheduling. The majority of institutions are using data to some extent to inform their course scheduling process and their decisions. Uh, but almost half of the institutions reported that they somewhat use data in the course scheduling process. Um, and this is uh, somewhat puzzling, I think, it depends on how you interpret what somewhat means. Maybe that's using it just not as much as they would like, or maybe just using it as kind of a, a small factor here. But I definitely think it, it leaves an open question of why are we all using all the info we have to create schedules that are truly optimized for students based on all the data uh, that schools have access to at this point. Um, so in the next slide, we're going to take a look at uh, some data points that may help with creating student-centric schedules. And so historically, there's been a bit of guesswork when it comes to creating the score, the course schedule. We've referenced uh, what this looks like in practice with just rolling things over or, or using faculty preferences and then taking our best guess at what makes sense for students. Uh, but as we also mentioned previously, that ACRO survey found that faculty availability and faculty preference were those top two factors. So uh, using those factors to, to create the course schedule means that even when we're taking our best guess at including uh, student, student needs, uh, faculty preferences still kind of end up being at the top of the list of factors. Uh, and looking at those, those previous terms, uh, gives an incomplete picture of how things may be changing, how enrollment may be changing, or how that previous schedule may have been imperfect and having some gaps when it comes to looking at student needs. Uh, so this gives a, a lot of schools a pretty big opportunity to uh, improve uh, how student focused their schedule actually is. Uh, and one way to do that is uh, to look at degree audit data to, to kind of see into the future and, and see where students are going and what courses students still need to take. Uh, and it can also help uh, scheduling teams see which courses are critical for program completion uh, versus others that may have some wiggle room where there's an, you know, another elective they could take, several courses that fulfill the math or the communications requirement versus those absolute must-have courses. Uh, and there are a couple of other metrics to keep in mind that we can touch on in this next slide. Um, there's so much that we can use to help us build a schedule that puts student needs first. Uh, and here are some of those additional metrics. So first, a course di distribution throughout the day and the week. Um, I'm sure you all are, are familiar with this pain point, but classes can be packed uh, between certain times of the day, 10 and two, 11 and three, whatever the case might be. Um, and faculty may be reluctant to teach outside of those hours, um, especially if we are factoring in faculty preference and department needs uh, first when creating these schedules. Uh, and that may not be what's best for students. Um, you know, we've talked with lots of different, different administrators and have heard all sorts of stories, uh, like one administrator who said that she couldn't work on uh, Tuesday and Thursday, um, or the student said she couldn't work on Tuesday and Thursday, um, and all the classes they needed were offered on Tuesday and Thursday and jammed into these prime time hours. So very quickly, not, not only even days become an issue, but uh, those times are, are really crammed um, and students can run into some challenges there. Uh, and this is also a problem with course distribution in the context of program maps. So for example, a student signs up for a program, uh, hoping to take all their classes at night. Uh, that's when they need to take courses because they're working. Um, they shouldn't complete their first two terms and then find out in the third term that the schedule shifts to daytime or early morning schedules, uh, completely blocking them uh, from progressing. So it's nice to look at course distribution across the program map and not just on a term by term basis. Uh, and then course section and fill rates are another useful metric here, uh, particularly for uh, gen ed courses or 
you know, famous courses on campus or, or milestone courses that a lot of students need to take, uh, institutions should check to see if all those courses are actually consistently at capacity. And if so, maybe not enough students are actually able to enroll. The timing needs to change. More sections need to be offered. We need to move this to the biggest auditorium on campus. Uh, but we should look at some solutions when we're running into that problem. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot on the slide, a lot of interesting questions to look at. Um, but those are just a couple of the, the key factors there. And so we can move on to our third poll question here. Um, so now we want to hear from you all on which data points do you use to inform your course schedule? So talked a lot of, uh, about a few examples there, but curious from this list, which ones you all are using. All right, so we have some results. Slightly larger distribution here. So the first option here, a course distribution throughout the day and the week, definitely. And then both with 56, enrollment, the program and course level and course and section fill rates. Yeah, I think from what we've seen, this aligns with uh, kind of the three most commonly used uh, data points here. And then, um, yeah, I think we have started to talk to some schools that are looking to pull in more info from program maps and degree audit systems and maybe project ahead uh, in some cases. So, um, you know, something we think about a lot, helping schools actually do that and make that a part of their process. Uh, Bridget, for you, anything here that jumps out that you want to touch on? No, I, I think you said it well. I think it's, you know, great to see that uh, so many folks are, are using um, at least a handful of that these data points. So I think that's really encouraging. But yeah, definitely, I think opportunities for some of those forward looking sources, you know, from degree audit data, things like that, um, that can help really kind of give that more real time assessment of where students and their needs are at. Totally. All right. And again, if, if any thing comes to mind for you all that wasn't included in that, that list of options, please throw it in the chat. We'll keep monitoring there. Uh, but moving on here to thinking about policies that put students first. So using data to inform that course scheduling process is one tool that we can use to help with course accessibility. Uh, and we can also do this from a policy perspective uh, and trying to avoid uh, detrimental scheduling practices um, and make sure that you know the policies we have are actually beneficial for students. Uh, a starting point is standard meeting patterns. So in hearing that courses adhere to a standard set of times uh, and can't be offered during overlapping times, as uh, make sure that students don't have to choose between courses just because one ends five minutes later than one starts. Uh, we have things spaced out with enforced meeting patterns and even uh, gaps in between start times whenever possible. Uh, and then for classes with very high demand, it can make sense to allocate seats for certain groups of students. So to, uh, seats in that section reserved for first or second year students uh, that may need that course to progress, or maybe they're a little bit ahead in their program map, but we want to save some space for them. Uh, but otherwise, they may, because of uh, you know that hierarchy and registration, not be able to sign up for that course. So setting aside a few seats for first and second year students can be helpful. Um, there's a few others here uh, on the slide for y'all to take a look at, but again, all about ensuring access to courses for students. So just making sure that we're offering things at the best times or making sure that 
co-rec and pre-rec courses don't overlap, uh, trying to implement policies to make it really easy to avoid some of these common pitfalls. And yeah, so having covered a, a bunch of different best practices and ideas and a lot of our learnings from uh, talking to folks and, and gathering some data on all this, uh, I just wanted to quickly cover uh, what we try to do to help institutions create a student-centric schedule with as many of those things uh, factored in as possible. Uh, so at a high level, uh, we try to empower academic administrators to support on-time completions uh, and operational excellence with integrated academic and event scheduling. Uh, we also integrate our academic and event scheduling with course demand projections, curriculum management, uh, syllabi management, uh, and an online catalog. Uh, and this is all uh, bi-directionally integrated with your SIS. So kind of one single ecosystem where all of your different uh, important operational pieces uh, could be talking to each other. Um, course dog is highly configurable, which means we'll be able to support your specific business practices uh, while also implementing a lot of those best practices we talked about. Rules for certain uh, scheduling things to make sure that prereqs and co-reqs aren't, uh, aren't scheduled at the same time and on and on down the list, but a mix of best practices and configurability uh, for your best practices is what we really try to focus on. Uh, and then I also just wanna to touch on uh, one of our newest products, Academic Operations Analytics, uh, which really gets to the heart of all we're talking about here. Um, so our scheduling analytics are built to uncover some of those insights that, that may be hard to find uh, for institutions uh, and helps make sure that the number of seats and the number of sections offered in specific sections aligns with student demand. We also make recommendations around when to offer sections and how to avoid scheduling conflicts. Um, and then we also help people clear their pathways and make decisions that ensuring uh, that their curriculum is financially sustainable and the program maps make sense. So trying to look at a combination of uh, scheduling data and your curriculum data and make the best recommendations possible uh, about improving your operations overall. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about uh, what we do, but I think uh, we want to take a couple questions here. I'll pass it back to Bridget. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Brian. So we're we're gonna save the last 10-ish minutes here for any questions that you all may have for us. So feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A function um, and we'll get to those. So we'll, we'll give everyone a, a minute or two to uh, think about any questions that they might have, type those in there. Um, but if not, then we can also hopefully end early. Also note, if you have any questions that come to mind afterwards, um, we are happy to take those um, over email too. Um, but it looks like we do have one question here in the Q&A and it says, any strategies to help guide faculty to focus less on them and focus more on the student's desire? Um, Great question. I, I think everyone is asking that. Um, but Brian, any initial thoughts you have here on this one? Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely take into account faculty preferences and department needs. There's, we, we support this in a bunch of different ways. So faculty preference forums, trying to uh, give individual department schedulers a really quick view of, oh, this course and this time fits this faculty member's preference by 100% or 50%. We can make it really easy to still factor in uh, faculty preferences to the scheduling process. We also help you implement uh, dozens of rules that you have to choose from in terms of student-centric scheduling processes that really can't be worked around. So we'll help optimize your, your room scheduling. We'll help create rules that say, oh, you know, courses must have a 10-minute buffer in between them. 
uh, will help you create relationships between courses. So if two courses are both, uh, you know, in a similar a gen ed or quantitative requirement, we can say these two courses or these two types of courses have to meet at different times. So uh, when we're uh, helping an institution implement course dog, we'll go through all those student centric uh, rules and configurations first, and then make sure that faculty uh, uh, preferences are also being taken into consideration. Um, or if schools still want to take faculty preferences uh, more heavily into consideration, we have lots of ways to do that as well. But we try to start with all of the student-centric rules uh, that we can help you all set up uh, and then, then look at faculty from there. Great. I, we have, I see two more questions in the chat. Is there a place to view the actual product? I'm curious what it looks like. Definitely, um, we can post several resources in the chat. The first place to go would just be coursedog.com to get an overall overview. But we can also definitely follow up and set up uh, some time for a demo and to dive deeper into the product as well. And then uh, do you meet with individuals on campus to help with solutions? Uh, definitely. Uh, similar thing, I think we, if folks are interested, we'd love to start with a demo talking about uh, your current needs on campus. And then um, we definitely have folks that would love to come meet you in person and talk more about how we can support you. Definitely. And I'm, I'm seeing there's a question here about a specific webinar. Um, so I would say probably one of the best places to go um, would be on our website. We actually have walkthrough videos of how many of our products work. Um, so I can go ahead and drop that link in the chat. But I would say that that could be um, probably a great place to start. And then like Brian said, we're also happy to, um, you know, set up individualized time to do a, a live walkthrough and ask any questions that you might have. So I just went ahead and, and dropped that link in the chat. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, well, if there, oh, do we have? Okay, great. If if we uh, don't have any more questions, I think we can probably go ahead and uh, wrap things up a few minutes early. So we have one just final poll question here for our internal knowledge, just a, a simple yes, no before you go on your way. But otherwise, um, thank you so much, everyone that's joined us today, that's asked questions, that's participated. Um, you know, we, we always love the audience engagement and, you know, it doesn't always happen. So thank you so much for that. And we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all.